Hello. So in this video, we're going to talk about Linton Quasi Johnson's poem, England is a Bitch, which is part of sort of the second wave of um, poetry and mostly, I think mostly poetry, but short, short fiction um, and, and stuff like this by... Either by by people who came to the UK as part of as children during the Windrush generation, um, the way that uh, that Johnson did. Uh, he was born in Jamaica in 1952. Um, he, he came to England when he was 11. Um, <clears throat> so people who came over as children as part of the Windrush generation, um, late 1940s through the early 1960s. Um, when you had a large amount of immigration from the Caribbean and from to, and from West Africa, um, former colonies and, and places like this, a lot of people, because they were British citizens uh, and had British passports, were able to migrate to Britain, to England often, but also to um, some of the industrial towns in Scotland like Glasgow. Um, Edinburgh to some of the places in in Wales um, to a lesser extent. So you had the first generation of Windrush poets, people who came over really as adults, um, people like Claude McKay and Louise Bennett, um, and they profoundly changed what English letters looked like. Um, they started incorporating um, Caribbean Patois, uh, from Jamaica, from Barbados, from these other places in the Caribbean, um, these distinctive dialects, they started presenting this as legitimate poetry, right? That, that should be read alongside the greats, Byron, Keats, Shelley, even Shakespeare. Um, and so this is a this is kind of a, a linguistic revolution in a way. Um, Johnson is in the next generation, so people who came over in the Windrush Rush generation as children, or the first generation of um, Afro Caribbean poets, artists, writers born in the UK itself. Um, and they took the foundation laid by people like Bennett and McKay and, and other, others of the, that first generation, and they built on it, they expanded on it. But they also became somewhat more cynical. Um, as you get into the late 60s and especially into the 70s, um, when, when Johnson really starts writing, I mean, he, he, I think, is still alive, actually. Um, he had a very, very long writing career. And as far as I know, he's still around. I may, I may be wrong about that. But um, he starts really writing and publishing in the 1970s. And <clears throat> like McKay and Bennett and these other uh, figures of, of the first generation, he uses in his case, Jamaican Patois, combined with the sort of pan, almost pan-Caribbean slang that develops in Brixton, which is a, a neighborhood in uh, London where, where he grew up. Um, Brixton is very famous for being a, a predominantly um, African diasporic neighborhood, Caribbean immigrants, West African immigrants, um, et cetera, et cetera. And then their, their children, obviously, today. Um, it was the site of the Brixton riots in 1982, I want to say. Um, <clears throat> so, I mean, it is, it, is, it is a kind of central location in terms of contemporary race relations in Britain. So Johnson grows up in Brixton once he 
comes to uh, the UK. And he is influenced, obviously, by Jamaican culture. He's influenced by these other, the, the cultures of other Caribbean and West African people living in Brixton. Um, but he's also really influenced by British racism. So whereas McKay and Bennett and people like this are, are a bit more optimistic about life in the UK, um, Johnson is much more gritty and much more willing to sort of confront the actual realities and the actual prejudice, um, not just in terms of like individual prejudice, but systemic prejudice as well. And we see that in a poem like England is a Bitch. Um, and one of the things that, that um, Johnson does that's really, really interesting and unique and important as a poet, um, <coughs> sorry, is that he, because he's influenced as so many Caribbean uh, poets or expat poets are, He's influenced by reggae and these other Caribbean music styles, calypso and things like this. Um, and so a lot of his poems are actually set to music. Like he performs them to music more like reggae than like traditional English lyric poetry of, again, somebody like Byron or Shelley or Keats, um, something like this. So. I will, if I remember, put a link down below and in a card up at the top, one side or the other, um, to Johnson, to a, a video of Johnson actually reading this poem. Um, so let's talk about the actual poem itself. I've, I've talked a lot about Johnson and his sort of place in the canon of, of contemporary British literature. Let's talk about the poem itself. So England is a bitch. Um, it, it definitely tells the story of the immigrant experience coming to the UK, struggling to find work, to make money, um, struggling particularly to find dignified work. So it starts out like this, and I'm going to I'm going to do my best to uh, sort of do this somewhat with a Jamaican patois. It will not be amazing. I'm I apologize in advance. I'm I'm going to try and read this as closely as I can to the way that it's actually written, which is written, I mean, you can see right here, this is written in a specific way to reflect Caribbean and West African style, dialect, the way that people speak in Brixton or spoke in Brixton in the 70s, whatever it is. So. When me just come to London town, me used to work pan the underground. But working pan the underground, you don't get fino your way around. England is a bitch, there's no escaping it. England is a bitch, there's no running away from it. Me get a little job in the big hotel, and after a while, me, do, me was doing quite well. Them start me, me off as a dishwasher, but when me temp... Uh, me take a stack, me no ten clock watcher. England is a bitch, there's no escape in it. England is a bitch, no butter, no butter try, uh, try if you hide from it. So that's our first couple of stanzas with the refrain. And there is that refrain. I mean, again, this is, uh, this is a poem that is very much inspired by music, by reggae. Um, and so the use of a refrain, very, very common in, in music much more common than it is in poetry that's really meant to be read silently in a book. Um, but one of the things that we, we get from the very beginning is this is a poet persona who is working these different jobs. Um, so he starts out working on the underground, um, not necessarily sure what he's doing on the underground, um, possibly construction, possibly maintenance work, possibly um, even driving one of the trains. I don't, I don't know exactly how that stuff works. I don't know what the drivers did in the 70s. 
Uh, but yeah, we get some sense that this is this is sort of menial work in some sense, and that's followed up in the second stanza, the second main stanza. I'm gonna I'm gonna number the I'm numbering the stanzas apart from the refrains. Um, the the poet persona gets a job in the hotel. Um, he's washing dishes, and he says here. Um, when me take a stack, when I started to make some money, um, me no ten clock watcha. Um, I didn't. I didn't become a lazy worker who just waited out my shift. Um, and so this is the kind of thing that we we get throughout the poem. Um, he used to work digging a ditch. Um, he worked day and night. Uh, he did clean work and dirty work. Um, he worked in a factory. So we've got this sense of like the types of jobs that would really have been available to people of color in the UK in the 1960s and 70s. These very low status, low paid menial jobs. And yet along with that, along with all of that hard work that um, the poet persona is doing to try and scrape by, we have the, this moment. Them say that black man is very lazy, but if uh, if you see how much, uh, if you see how me work, you would say me crazy. So we've got again this sense that that the reality of the world that this poet persona finds himself in is bumping up against this sort of ide ideologies, right? The racism, the racist narrative of white supremacists in England and in the U.S., my country, um, is that people of color are lazy. They just want the government to support them. They want to live on welfare, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, and and yet, the poet persona is doing all of these different jobs, all of these difficult, labor-intensive in many cases, and poorly paid jobs to try and make ends meet. And so we have that contradiction. And there is even a reference to the idea of taking the dole. Um, in the, the last stanza, me, dona, me know them have work, work in abundance, yet still they make me redundant. Now at 55, me getting quite old, Yet still, them send me fo uh, send me figo draw dole. I think I fucked that one up, but you know. Uh, so yeah, this is the idea that there is work to be done, and the poet persona is still pursuing work, even as he's starting to get old. And I mean, fifty-five may or may not sound incredibly old, but if you have lived a life of hard work difficult work, yeah, you may be quite worn down by age 55. Um, and even though there is work still to be done, the poet persona says they've made me redundant. They've they've fired me from my job, and now, now I'm being criticized for drawing government assistance, even though this is a program meant to help people out of work. So we've got these, these elements here. Um, we've got these critiques of wage theft, um, which, of course, is, in the U.S. at least, is the single biggest form of theft. Um, more money is lost to, to wage theft than to any other type of crime. You can look that up, and I encourage you to do so. Um, but particularly for precarious workers, immigrant workers, um, low status workers, people doing unskilled labor, um, they are much more at risk of wage theft than people who are of higher social status. And so we do have this stanza, third stanza, um, again, ignoring the refrains. Um, when them give you the little, little wage packet, First dim rabbit with them big tax bracket. You have to you have a struggle, the make ends meet, 
And when you go to bed, you just can't sleep. So, I mean, we got wage theft, but we've also got taxation here. And I'm less of a critic of taxation because taxation often does fund public services. Though, yes, it's a fair critique that government often is inefficient with the way that money is spent. Um, but again, one of the things that we have here is this idea of the loss of wages, the loss of what the money that one was otherwise entitled to, making the worker's life even harder, making it more difficult to make ends meet. So it's a it's an, a really, really interesting, really, really good poem that again uses these techniques that we see in a lot of, of Caribbean poetry and a lot of, of British Caribbean poetry. Um, the use of Jamaican patois or, or a different Caribbean patois or Creole or something like this. But again, Johnson is part of this generation that becomes much more critical, maybe even much more cynical about opportunities in the United Kingdom.